now I think we should hear from Dr. Kim. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Dato gave me uh, a very perfect segue into the discussion, um, not on an individual level, but on a state level. And uh, I'm going to first set the scene. So we're all Floridians, and if we're not Floridians, we've lived in Florida for a while. And I remember in 1992, August, we got hit with a hurricane, Andrew. Um, I was just in high school, and I remember the house shaking. I remember being terrified. I remember the fear of not having anywhere to escape. I remember being confined in the very place that I live. I couldn't go outside because it was more dangerous outside than within the borders of my own home. Now take that sensation and magnify 20-fold, 40-fold, exponentially. Within the borders of your residence, the very state that is set out to protect you has targeted you for extermination. You have been targeted for extermination. I do a disservice by associating the events of Hurricane Andrew to an event of genocide. I do a disservice in associating the psychological trauma that it causes to the psychological trauma that it causes an individual who has experienced such targeting. Now, imagine, if you will, that I have a grievance with Dr. Willits. He didn't know, unbeknownst to him, I have a grievance with Dr. Willits. But I want to manifest this grievance in the most egregious way possible. But I do not want to be held accountable for my offense. So I formulate a diabolical plot. I am going to strike him as hard as I can, yet I'm not going to be held accountable. My intent is to harm him, but I do not want to be punished for my intent. So I cloak it in an act of generosity. So I imagine that there's a fly buzzing in the room. And the fly is buzzing and it lands on <laughs> Dr. Willett's uh, shoulder. Of course, there is no fly. And with all the wrath and all the anger that I can muster, I raise my hand and whack! <laughs> and I shrunk him down. Jason! What was that for? There was a fly. I was trying to get the fly off of your, off of your, your, your shoulder. Well, well, I appreciate that, Jason, but next time could you hold down on the intensity? Do you see how I successfully manipulated my intent to do harm and actually got praise? Now, how does this pertain to genocide? Article 2 of the Conventions on the Prevention and Punishment of Crimes of Genocide, from here on out, which I'll refer to as the UNGC, states precisely this. This is what it states. This is the uh, where the problems come in for legal theorists and lawyers. In the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts, which I'm not going to go through and read them all, committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethical, racial, religious group as such. The intent to destroy. Notice that that is a qualitative, not quantitative term. The biggest problem we have when discussing genocide is that people tend to discuss genocide in terms of its quantification. How many people died? So if I say 300,000 people died, is that enough people? Well, uh, looking at the UNGC, it doesn't talk about quantification. It doesn't talk about numbers. It talks about the intent. Does everybody understand that? So it is not so much if 299,999 people died as opposed to 300 thousand people died because then the question of uh, an arbitrary threshold comes into question. It seems rather arbitrary that we have now designated a number and once that threshold is reached we will then classify the uh, title of, gen of genocide on the map. Genocide then is not determined, genocide is not determined by quantity of deaths but the intent to destroy in whole or in part. What I uh, intend on doing is to set the framework with which Professor Dano, Professor Willits, and myself, what we're attempting to do is 
we're attempting to articulate genocide in a sense, meaning probably the most conceptual way, so that individuals understand that if we're coming to analyze an instance of genocide, something which we think might be an act of genocide, these criteria will help you understand how to assess what it is that you're observing. The first thing that I want you to call into question and keep in mind is that it has nothing to do with numbers. Genocide is not about numbers. Genocide is about intent. Now, um, as you heard Professor Donahoe say, and rightfully so, this has specific ramifications for political leaders and people in control of the limits of sovereignty. And not to get into a very boring technical, because as I said, this is not going to be um, a technical discussion, a state is limited in its most general sense by its borders, just like the house is limited by its walls. Within the home, um, whoever is the head of the home is in charge of how members subordinate to that leader, if you, if you want to classify it, my kids wouldn't want me to say that I was the leader of the home, nor would my wife in the audience want me to say uh, of the home. There's a certain amount of responsibility that's important. But more important for our discussion is realizing that when we are talking about the limits, we're also talking about the interior. What's the important part? What's inside of the borders? The borders just tell me the limits of sovereignty. It doesn't tell me what's important. And what's important is state demography. Now, that's the only jargon I'm going to throw out, I promise. State demography is any quantifiable, statistically verifiable characteristic which can be attributed to a human being. I am a black man. She is a white female. He is a heterosexual male. She is a homosexual female. These are characteristics that can be identified. They can be census. We can use it for census <coughs> and for um, sort of a projection of national demography. Now imagine, if a state says to themselves, hmm, I'm in power, just like with my, my example that I showed you with uh, Dr. Willits, if I want to exterminate a certain group, well, they must possess certain demographic identifiers that I want out of my state. You know, there's too many Jewish people in my state. And I'm going to go about and remove these people bearing those identifiers from my state. If it's through mass exile, if it's through mass extermination, if you possess that demographic identifier, you're gone. Now, it's important to realize that dem demographic identifiers come into two categories. You have no, on the one hand, you have identifiers known as mutable identifiers. I am a Democrat. I could be a Republican. My younger brother is a Republican. He could be a Democrat. Um, I'm a pretty open-minded individual. If someone were to convince me of um, sort of a conservative ideology, sure, I might, I might vote for a Republican president. I don't have any qualms against that. Meaning that that characteristic, which is quantifiable, can be shifted. I could be a Republican, I could be a Democrat. Therefore, it's mutable. An immutable identifier is something which cannot be changed. For example, I am a black man. I cannot be a white man. Now, I don't believe in race. It's probably a horrible example. But it translates the point. Mutable demographic identifiers, immutable demographic identifiers. If you look at an instance, let's say, in, um, in Cambodia, where Khmer were versus Khmer, what ends up happening in that situation is that it's more mutable. It's more, you know, some people will argue it's politicide, some people will argue that it's genocide. But what happened is that if you represented an alternative political party, you were set for extermination. Now, if you were to change that, well, we'll, we'll, we'll grant you a little bit of grace. You're not going to be set for extermination. So that the state now can use pressure and use force to get you to conform. Is it possible for you to conform if the intent of the state is to destroy you because you possess an immutable identifier? That's a mouthful. Do you think the state, is it possible for you to change that? Well, no. The state wants to destroy me because I am, and I possess a certain characteristic that I can't get rid of. 